Welcome to our today's Java user group talk about ArcUnic unit testing architecture and design. And I'm really happy that Thomas Mu from, from Germany, I think even from Frankfurt area, um, is joining Hamburg. us. Sorry? Hamburg. Hamburg. Okay, I'm very sorry about that. Is joining us uh, to, to present the topic. I'm Patrick from the Java user group, and I just will do a short introduction as quite often like in the last time. And that means like I do like the organizational topics. As you might know, we have this online format already going on for a few months. And we're using this tool, which is called Big Marker. And we will also publish the talks a few days after this live um, webinar. So just make sure you press the subscribe button and the bell button on YouTube so you get notified if you are missing one of the talks. And as you can see, we have published already quite a few of them and some of them have already a lot of views. So that's actually really nice. We also have a Slack channel and sometimes um, after the talks, we join there and actually um, continue the, the discussions. So you might also use um, the, our Slack inviter um, to get actually part of our um, public Slack channel. For us, it's always important that we have um, feedback and also valuable feedback from your side. So therefore, you will be forwarded after the presentation to the feedback form as usual. So the feedback form is used as a set for us to, to actually get better. And we are also like making a raffle every month with an idea an um, IntelliJ license. So make sure you fill out the form. Perfect. We have like 15 seconds of delay. And that means like if we have some interactive parts, um, there might be sometimes a awkward silence. That's not because of you or us. That's just because of the delay. We also have a chat function. So go into the chat, say hello, say hello from where you're joining. And then actually, if you have issues with the connections or you don't hear Thomas very well, then actually you can write there and Marcus usually answers the things and helps you out what you could do. For questions, we like to have them actually in the Q&A section because there is an awesome feature where you can upvote the questions and we will go through the questions like step by step. And if there is like an urgent questions or like one which fits very well to the topic which is just presented, I might jump in and ask the question to Thomas. But as discussed, we will actually have the most of the questions at the end of the presentation. There is um, also the feature of polls, and we are going to use this. And you just can actually try this right now, because I have one for you already, which I now send off. And it's about like, when should we do um, like um, future events? Because we had a discussion in the Slack channel this week where somebody said, it's maybe better if we would start at five o'clock than just like six o'clock. And just to get a feeling about that, I uh, now send out the poll so we can vote and we can get a feeling for the shoot. I'm sure um, we are biased because you're participating at six o'clock. So I'm asking the persons who are joining at six o'clock, but still like maybe some of you said the topic is so important. I'm still joining, but I would still like love to have it on a other time. Thank you very much for the um, answers. It's actually going quite well. We have like 37 um, answers already. And um, the others can also do it later. I keep the poll a little bit open. So now that is already everything, Thomas. And um, I would love to hand over to you for the presentation. And I'm really actually curious about the topic of ArcUnic and how you like test architecture and design. and I would say the stage is yours and I switch over to your um, screen and then actually we will meet latest at the end and ask the questions or answer the questions and from the participants. So have fun. Yeah, thanks Patrick. And good evening everybody and uh, 
Thanks for joining my session about unit testing architecture and design using ArcUnit. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, I'm Thomas, Thomas Much from Hamburg. Um, I'm a software developer. I'm a coach for agile engineering practices, but I did not invent ArcUnit. That is That was Peter Gaffert. He's the original author and uh, the maintainer of ArcUnit. Um, meanwhile, there are many contributors to ArcUnit and, and me, I'm just a happy user of that library. I, I use ArcUnit in several of my and my customers' projects. And if I don't contribute to ArcUnit by code, I do so by spreading the word. And that's why I want to talk, that's why I want to show ArcUnit to you uh, today. And before we jump into, into the talk, let's start with a quick poll. I'd like to know um, I'd like to know what kinds of uh, applications you're building. Um, are you just building um, are you just building microservices or monoliths um, or both? Or without going any further into architectural styles, don't you do anything of that? Or do, does it mean anything to, to you, these words? So let's see and wait what you're building. Um, if you're on the traditional way of building monoliths um, or both. So it seems that the largest part of you is building both. And uh, quite intentionally, I left out some newer forms of architectural styles like monoliths, but we'll have a look at them later on. All right, numbers aren't changing anymore that much. So nearly half of you is building microservices as well as monoliths. That's perfect because ArcUnit can check both of them. Um, and to you, to, to all those of you who don't know these differences, uh, I'll show you in a second. Um, another poll. Um, which of the tools you we might see during our talk are you already using? Uh, are you already using ArcUnit, um, JUnit? Probably yes, but um, if you use it, please check this. It's a, a multiple choice, multiple multiple answer poll. Um, do you know and use uh, JQ Assistant or Structure 101, Sonar Cube, uh, or anything else? Um, let's have a look. As expected, many of you are using JUnit. Um, we didn't ask for test in G here. Um, and Sonar Cube as a really prominent um, software metrics aggregator um, has a lot of users as well. So numbers are stable, quite stable again. Only a few of you use ArcUnit already. That's perfect for today because I will show you the basics and the idea behind ArcUnit, but we'll also have a look into the um, interesting features that uh, that you won't find uh, as prominent in the user guide. Um, but I think they're, they're worth to know uh, to get started with ArcUnit. So um, that's pretty, yeah, that's perfect. Thanks very much. And let's get back to the slides. Before I uh, talk about architectural styles, let's have a quick look at what architecture is anyway, um, because uh, architecture is a broad term and there are a lot of definitions what architecture is. And some important people, respected people, um, architects um, said, architecture is all the decisions, all the technologies or so everything that we consider important in our project that's hard to change or expensive to change later on. Um, of course, architecture will be the structure and conventions within one service, within one artifact, like the packages and uh, the structure of the packages and the containment of the classes. It might be the architecture between systems, especially if we're building microservice systems. It the complexity lies in the communication between those systems. 
And there is the human aspect of architecture. It's the shared understanding of what we've built, of the system and its parts. Uh, do we understand, do we as a development team or the ones that will follow after us, do they understand our system? And as today we're going to talk about ArcUnit, let's see what we can test, what we can check using ArcUnit. Of course, it's the structure and conventions like packages and classes and so on. Um, but it's also the decisions that we made. We can code our decisions in ArcUnit rules. We can execute them as JUnit tests and we have kind of a executable documentation. And that's uh, pretty powerful um, for future developers on the same project. And we can document our shared understanding of the system, like this executable documentation. What ArcUnit cannot test is the communication between the systems. ArcUnit checks your architecture within your system, within your, the boundary of your system, but it doesn't check the communication between the systems. Uh, and it, it depends upon your architectural style, uh, like the interfaces or the, the um, adapter layers or adapter modules that you'll use. Um, if you can check your communication up to that point, to the next system, but you cannot change, uh, you cannot check the communication between those systems. Why should we unit test architecture and design? Uh, and let me give you some background um, about uh, the projects, uh, about the projects that I've been working in and that I'm still working in. Um, I was working since um, several years actually in microservice systems or self-contained systems um, at a large large uh, e-commerce customer. Um, we built the teams uh, built a large microservice um, system, microservice platform, and we split our domain. Uh, we split the product into several domains, and that's a pretty modern style of architecture because we get small systems. Uh, we can check the architecture within these microservices or self-contained systems, but the complexity, as I said, complexity lies in the, in the communication between those systems. Um, with ArcUnit, we could check the artifacts inside the single microservices or the single self-contained systems. And there are other architectural styles that I'm used to that I uh, have to maintain. And those are those large monoliths. I chose this friendly blue, not some black. Um, and we've got those large code bases. And the problem with them is that the uh, domain classes are scattered all across your large code base. And it's really hard to find all the classes that belong together to one domain. And worse yet, um, those monoliths, monoliths often have a layered architecture. And if your monolith is large enough, it happens that your teams are cut the same way as your layered architecture. So you've got a front end team and a back end team and a, another team for another layer. And those teams have to know everything about all the domains uh, that belong to the front end. That's really hard to maintain. And it's uh, not um, maybe not that scalable as we'd like it to be. So I'd like ArcUnit to help me to refactor my monolith into a friendlier monolith, where I can put all the classes that belong together to one domain, where I can put them together, set up rules to check that they stay together and don't scatter again um, across uh, the project. And if we take this structure, this refactoring further, we can build even more friendly monoliths where we, where we have the classic, the traditional um, layered architecture in the core of the monolith. And in the tiny modules that we separated already, we can have different architectural styles, more suitable for, let's say, microservices. And this way we can extract parts of our monolith to a microservice, deploy them separately and get a maintainable, a more maintainable architecture. Now, we've seen um, layers, layered architectures, and I'd like ArcUnit to check those architectures for me and to help me migrating those large monoliths to microservices. Question is, um, if I migrate to microservices or if I've got a microservice architecture, should I check for layers like this? Um, that we have a user at the front clicking through our um, websites and a database at the back end. 
clever people found out that it's not so clever to talk about top and bottom, but it's better to talk, talk about outside and inside. We've got the outside that is external systems um, uh, or external users and the user uh, as well as the database are external systems outside of our service. And we've got the inside of the service. And um, modern approaches are they are around for let's say 15 years, maybe 20 years, are something that is that fits really well to microservices or domain-driven design. And that's uh, the hexagonal architecture. Um, and with some differences, the onion style architecture or the ports and adapters architecture. They are quite similar. Um, and the idea behind those architectural styles is that we've got small services that encapsulate their domain knowledge and they communicate with other services. But we've got an, an adapter for every service that we're talking to. Uh, and we, if we stop talking to that service, we can throw, throw away that adapter without changing the core domain of my service. And ArcUnit is able to check those architectural styles as well. All right. Now, what do we check? We've seen those different architectural styles. What do we check using uh, ArcUnit? We can check the dependencies between packages or modules. We can check the cohesion that classes that belong together stay together. And we can check for loose coupling that classes that don't belong together don't access, don't access each, each other. And of course, we can check for conventions and patterns. There are other tools to check for conventions and patterns, but you can do this with ArcUnit as well to keep it in one place. How did we find our way to ArcUnit? We had some um, traditional software metrics in place, like JQ Assistant, a really brilliant tool, or Class Cycle. Uh, we made heavy use of Class Cycle, and of course, Check Style and others. The problem was some of them, uh, some of the tools were outdated. We couldn't use them anymore; they weren't maintained anymore. Um, others weren't customizable enough. We had several requirements uh, for checking our architecture. And uh, some of those tools weren't uh, customizable enough. And uh, others had a proprietary configuration language like JQ Assistant, really brilliant for checking um, the architecture afterwards with a query language um, that's really brilliant. But for um, a common developer in a software development team, that's often too much to, to use it daily um, as part of our build and uh, test process. Um, so we didn't want to use that. And we had another restriction. We shouldn't buy anything. I don't know if that's a good restriction, but we shouldn't buy anything. So we were using open source. And at the, at the end of 2017, I saw a tweet that said, here is ArcUnit, an early version of ArcUnit. And I thought, wow, that sounds like uh, unit testing my architecture. And that was it. And uh, next week, I had that tool in my project. And I think uh, that project still use it, uses it up to this day um, because it's just a really useful small tool that you can um, adapt, yeah, that you can use really easily. Why? The architectural stack uh, checks with ArcUnit are plain unit tests. Uh, you can use it with any unit testing framework you like. We, you've got special support for JUnit 4 and 5 but you can use it with any unit testing framework. It's just um, another library, another dependency. Um, and then you've got um, like a, a DSL um, that you can use for your architectural checks, but it's um, the running of those tests is up to your unit testing framework. And those tests are plain Java code. If you can write Java or Kotlin, um, Kotlin is supported as well. Um, if you're writing your Java code, you will be able to write ArcUnit tests. And that's great because uh, architecture suddenly becomes a team sport. All of us developers, we can take care of our architecture and note down rules for our architecture in Java code. It's easily customizable and it's, it's extendable. We can write our own uh, rules and predicates and uh, everything that we'd like to write. Checking is done at bytecode level. That makes um, most sense because we want to check the architecture that is um, that will run actually. Um, but you won't find violations at say Java doc level. 
but I think that's fine for most usages. Including ArcUnit is easy. You just choose uh, the artifact that suits you. Either you're using JUnit 4 or 5, then you'll take uh, the special dependency. Otherwise, you just include the core ArcUnit dependency, uh, and then you go. Um, I'll show you the latest, the latest version. That's 0.14.1. Um, I put it in a test scope, and yeah, that's it. Let me see. I think, um, yeah, I told you most of this already. Um, there are Maven and Gradle plugins. Um, I think the, uh, a bank um, developed um, plugins for ArcUnit. Uh, I won't show them in this talk, but uh, you'll find them uh, on the ArcUnit, uh, links to them on the ArcUnit webpage. Um, those plugins um, can check, can uh, include uh, ArcUnit tests into your build cycle, not as um, the usual unit tests, but uh, as part of the build cycle for all of your projects. This way you can say, we've got some basic checks. You put them in a jar archive and have those uh, plugins execute those basic checks for all of your projects, uh, especially for larger companies who have some certain policies or some checks that must be done or some guidelines that must be followed. Um, that's an easy way to enforce those rules. Uh, just use those uh, plugins, uh, activate those plugins, and you, you can run those basic checks that you've written yourself. Um, the plugins come with some um, predefined checks, but you can write the checks yourself. Um, have an arc, uh, make a uh, JAR archive out of them and use them in your builds. Okay. Already time for the live demo. Let me switch to IntelliJ. Um, okay, but before that, let me have a quick look at the chat. If there's something on the Q&A, no, then let's just go to um, IntelliJ. Okay, let me switch to presentation mode and I think I think this is large enough for you to see. Okay. All right. Um, I'll provide the slides after the talk. I'll, I'll tweet a link to the slides and I'll also uh, tweet a link to my GitHub repo where I'll upload um, the live coding examples. And you'll also find uh, some examples that maybe I won't be able to show today. Um, but it's a pretty small demo application that we can hopefully easily understand what we're going to check here. Um, let me show you the POM first. I'm using Java 15 for demo, for demo purposes, uh, just to see if it works, and hopefully it will. Um, ArcUnit requires uh, a minimum of Java 7, so that should be okay for most of us for most of us. Uh, let's hope that uh, not many of you run older Java versions, but you will need at least Java 7. Um, Java 15 will run as well. I, uh, I've included um, ArcUnit for JUnit 4. You can, of course, use JUnit 5, and I've used the latest version on test scope. And I'll include other dependencies, for example, Jakarta Enterprise. I do this uh, to have some um, annotations handy, um, which I'll need for the checks. But of course, you can include like Spring, Spring Boot, or any other framework that you're using. That's, to, uh, that's just for me uh, to have uh, my classes, uh, the classes that I really often work with handy uh, for the demo classes. All right, let's have a look at the structure of the project. This is mainly a structure of packages, not so much of classes. But as you see, uh, we've got a, a package hierarchy um, like those um, vertical cut domains I showed you at the beginning, like we've got order, product, search, and user, like an e-commerce application. And all of them look the same, so we can do some reasoning uh, about the containment, uh, the dependencies of those classes. Every domain has an uh, API package with a model package. That's pretty classic. I'm not uh, pretty traditional. I'm not sure if uh, we're going to 
do this in the most fancy, most modern architectural styles. Um, but you'll often find this. Uh, this is um, intended to be a real world example. So we've got API with a model, and maybe this is a JPA entity. And within AP, we've got an interface for our order service. In the back end, we've got um, an order repository for, let's say, database access and an implementation of our order service interface. And in the front end, we've got an order bean like a JSF bean or whatever front end framework you're using. And the other uh, modules, the other vertical slices look the same. All right, then time to write our first test. Let's get started. Okay, there we go. Call this first test. Yes. Let's generate the first test, my first argument test. Um, and I'll do live coding for most of the rest of the time. Um, and at the end, uh, before the end, I'll get back to some some few slides and we'll, then we'll do a, a round of Q&A. Okay. If you're working with uh, ArcUnit, you'll have to import your classes and packages, uh, all the classes and packages that you want to write rules about. And we'll do this via a class file importer. And the class file importer can import many things. So, I will be importing packages soon, and you can import one packages, one package or many packages, package structures actually, package hierarchies. You can import classes as well, or the class path with, with several options. On the ArcUnit website, you'll find the user guide and it explains those options uh, in detail. Uh, you can import jar files, uh, import locations like paths or um, some uh, net shares, whatever you like. You can even write your own um, location um, providers that you can access any place of classes that you can load. But I'll go with the simplest solution. I'll just import some packages in the structure uh, called Mosoft. As you'll see, that will cover everything inside my demo application. Yeah, I could say Mosoft demo. Now let's assign this um, to imported classes. And now um, with those imported classes, I can try to get a single class of, out of it. Let's say uh, the order bean. And this pretty much looks like reflection, like Java reflection. And uh, the meta model that ArcUnit imports is actually similar to Java reflection, but it offers more because it offers the relationships between the classes. So I am not only able to get like the package name and the simple name of the class and the modifiers, I'm also able to get all the accesses from self that is from my class to other classes. I can get the accesses to my class from all of the classes that I imported. I can get the calls uh, to constructors that I make and so on. So you don't only get meta information about the structure of the class itself, but also, and uh, that's the most important part for ArcUnit, about the relationships between those classes. Um, and you get information, or you can query information about every single aspect of, of your class files, like say the static initializers and do some reasoning about it. Now we could write um, our architectural rules using this low level um, API that ArcUnit offers, but that would be really tedious and you'll get uh, non-readable Java code. So we don't do this. We get an idea what's happening behind the scenes. Now, what we're going to do is I write a rule about classes. And there is, um, we call it a transformer. 
that is a method that transforms the imported classes and packages into something that we want to write rules about, like all the classes or all the methods or all the fields. And you can write even your own transformers. Um, I've got an example uh, somewhere here um, where I transform all the classes to its static initializer blocks. And we can write rules about those static initializer blocks. So um, that's pretty powerful, but I'm going to use the most often used starting point, and that's the classes. And I can say classes should be public. I'm not sure if this is a good rule, um, but you get an idea of what those rules looks like, look like. Now let's make this um, a static import, and we can read it uh, more easily. And I'll assign this to our rule. And you see, this is a class of should conjunction. There's a lot of uh, um, type magic happening behind the scenes, but this is just a um, subclass of arc rule. And so let's use arc rule here. Now I've got my rule and I can check this rule or the other way around. I check the rule against the imported classes. Okay, now let's see if it runs. It runs, but the test fails. Now, what does it say? Class BAM doesn't have modifier public. Well, okay. Yeah, right. Um, so where is BAM? There is BAM. Okay, let's make this public just to get the test green. Yeah, fixed violation. Um, of course, I shouldn't do this. So let's revert this. Um, let's see that the test is red again, because now we've got a violation about a pretty uh, broad, uh, pretty broad rule. So maybe the rule should be restricted. And let's say not all classes should be public, but all the classes that reside in a package API. That is, and the two dots mean um, somewhere on the package hierarchy, some API package somewhere in your package structure. So only classes that reside in the package API should be public. That sounds more reasonable, might not be perfect, but that's at least sounds more reasonable. And as BAM isn't part of our API, of any API package, it's part of the demo package, now the test runs fine. It's green. So this is your first ArcUnit test that makes any sense. And it's really easy to let yourself be guided by the API that uh, ArcUnit provides. You just see what's there. You just have to remember that classes that anything should mm -hmm -hmm, anything else. Let's write our second test. And let me just duplicate this one. Let's get more technical, like um, maybe some of you are using uh, Java Enterprise or Jakarta Enterprise, um, which is a valid choice even for uh, modern ecosystems. But we want to make sure that we don't use old, um, old patterns or old technologies. Uh, for example, um, we don't want to have stateful EJBs. Yeah, I don't like them. Um, I don't want to have them in my project. So. Let's say, let's see, what could the rule look like? Classes um, should not be annotated with stateful. Okay. So keeping fingers crossed that we don't have any stateful EJBs, we are lucky. But don't trust any test that hasn't been read. Let's make this red. So I'll turn BAM into a stateful EJB. Okay. As expected, um, we get an architecture violation. It says classes should not be annotated with stateful and we get a reference to the class. Okay. Now, um, 
maybe it's obvious to you why we shouldn't use uh, stateful EJBs, but maybe it's not that obvious for our future co-developers. So we should add a reason why we set up this rule and I can do this using because. Also should not be annotated with stateful because they don't scale well. If I run this test, we get the violation as before, but now well, it's the same violation, but now we get the generated message from ArcUnit. Classes should not be annotated with stateful. And then we get our reason because they don't scale well. So we can document why we use certain architectural rules. And that's really powerful um, because our future developer uh, colleagues will understand why this uh, rule exists and if they should really change it. If it happens that this auto-generated um, message is too complex, and uh, if you've got really complex rules, that might be too complex in, um, in your um, test unit test result, you can replace the whole message, then you will be using as. And as will replace all the auto-generated message with just the string that we provide here. Yeah, architecture violation, they don't scale well. I don't think that's, um, a good choice this patient most of the time you will be using because to add something to the auto generated message but if that gets too big or too complicated you can replace that message okay now that's our first two tests let's do some containment checks and the numbers that it shows um, like number one and i will copy this as number two um, you find um, similar named um, similar named files here. Um, so you can check uh, if I showed you everything and you can check for, uh, for certain um, demos that I won't be showing you today uh, that we maybe we'll talk in the Q&A afterwards. But that's the reason why I put in here some numbers. So let's just copy this. Yes. Now what I'm gonna do. Um, I only need one test. And I'd like to test at my implementation classes, the classes that have those uh, impl suffixes, uh, that they exist in our backend only and not in the front end. Now, how does our rule look like? Classes that have a simple name ending with impl. That's it. Okay. Should reside in a package. Okay, I think that's it already. Um, that's the easiest solution for my test. I'll show you a slightly more complicated one because you can do pattern matching. I cannot only say have simple name ending with have simple na name, but I can also say have name matching. And I can place a regular expression here and check for nearly everything about the structure of our names. The names, And let's go with this one and see if this test runs. Okay, we get a violation because um, our user impl, that's something in user API model doesn't reside in a package backend. That's true. Okay, let's have a look at the user. Yeah, it's in API. Now, this is a legacy application. Uh, this has grown over the years and maybe we cannot uh, change it instantly. We cannot refactor it, but maybe we can say, okay, we cannot refactor it, but let's uh, say it's deprecated. And I can say, okay, the test uh, should um, should be green if those impl classes are in a backend, or or should be annotated with deprecated.
All right, now the test is green because it's deprecated and we can do the refactoring later on. But it as it happens, uh, you won't be able to change the code of some classes. Um, so maybe we cannot annotate it with deprecated. So we have to stay with, that, with this uh, violation. And that's um, annoying uh, since you have a lot of violations in your legacy code, how to cope with this. Fortunately, uh, ArcGenet offers at least two solutions and let's have a look at some resources. Um, ArcGenet uh, allows you to uh, ignore certain violations and I can ignore violations um, with their um, message. So I can just say everything that has user input in it or should be ignored by ArcGenet. And I've prepared uh, a regular expression like this one. So let's activate it. Uh, and this means everything that's got user input in it should be ignored. Okay, so it's green. The violation is still there, but I ignore it. And this means um, I get a list in this file, Action and Ignore Patterns. I get a list of all the places that I will have to refactor, but I can't do it just now. Uh, I'll have to do it later on. And that's pretty easy to do to ignore certain violations um, that we have no clue, no idea how to fix it now. Uh, we can just leave them there, but the rest of the application is checked that you don't have any more violations because we can now activate our rule. The rule will be enforced for new code and the violations in the old code that we cannot change that we can exclude from the violations here. This works pretty well uh, for migrating um, your monolith or your legacy application to a new set of rules that you decided to, uh, to uh, that you decided to check. But if your legacy application um, violates hundreds or thousand times your rules, this list will be endless. And to maintain this uh, manually is not uh, it's not practical it's and uh, it's really annoying so we'll use a we'll use a different approach um we can do um we can let arcunet store all the violations and take care that those violations won't uh, grow that there won't be any new violations but we can um, remove violations and that is uh, we'll do this by freezing our architecture so let me copy this test Call it frozen legacy. And just let's run this test. Uh, refactor rename. Okay, there, and it gets in the right order. Now let's run this test. And it fails because I'm, um, I've deactivated those ignore pattern again. And now we have to see something without those ignore patterns. Now I can freeze this architectural rule and I'll do this by calling freeze. There's a freezing arc rule and I can freeze my rule. Static import all of this and assign it to frozen rule. And as freezing arc rule is a subclass of arc rule, this is just my new arc rule. And now I won't check the rule against the imported classes, but the frozen rule. Okay, let's run this and let's see what happens. I don't get a violation, but I get a failure, an exception, and it says, Okay, I checked your architecture, but I cannot store all the violations. I have to create a new violation store and that's disabled. Please enable it by configuration. And there is an argument properties and I can, able, I can enable the creation and the updating of a violation store. And uh, this store, uh, let's have a look what happens and then we'll have a look at this store. Now I run this test again. I haven't changed the test. I haven't changed the code. And now this test is green, although there are still the violations of those user input class. What happened? 
as you'll see, Argent has generated uh, a new file. Let's have a look where it is. It's up here in the ArcUnit folder. And this is the default path of the ArcUnit store. You can relocate this path to anything you like. You can even write your own storage providers, for example, to upload those storage to an um, AWS S3 bucket or anything you like. Um, for simplicity reasons, I just leave it at the default place. Um, and it generates two files. One file, all the stored rules. And these are all the um, regular expressions for the violation messages that should be ignored. And that's everything that your rule re reported in the last run. And then we get um, all the violations for that rule. Now let's have a look at the violations. That's in user impl, that's the violation of this class. Okay. Now, Arcunet checks um, that I won't um, won't code any new violations for this rule, but I can remove violations. Let's do this. Let's fix user impl. And let's fix it by just um, marking it as deprecated. That's the easiest fix for the time being. And now if I run the test, it's green again. Okay, I fixed it, but something else happened. Let's have a look at the stored rules. They are still there. But if I open the occurrences of those rule violations, you'll see that idea um, IntelliJ doesn't know what to do with it because it's an empty file. So the one occurrence that we had has been removed. I fixed it. And now the, there are no occurrences anymore. Um, that's great because we, we removed one violation and you can refactor your existing application violation by violation. Um, take care that the store actually will be empty, but uh, Arcunet takes care that no new violation for this rule will be coded again. For example, if I uh, remove the deprecation annotation, this would be a new violation for that rule. Then Arcunet complains again because I removed that before and it's not allowed, I, I must not violate that um, that rule anymore with new code uh, with new code sites. Okay. Now let's have a look at the time. Um, okay, you get the basic idea of what ArcUnit can do, how you can include it, how you can use it for your existing applications, where probably many violations will be reported. Let me show you some um, some other interesting aspects in. Um, in the prepared examples, I think that's better for, yeah, that's better for our time box. Now, you can do something like caching. I'll import all the classes, um, each and every test. We can import those classes once um, with an analyze classes annotation. You'll find more on it in the user guide. It's not that difficult. We can write rules about dependencies between packages and classes and about inheritance. But the important point I want to show you is architectural styles. And let me just use the prepared examples. The most common style probably is still is a layered architecture, although everything's moving to, uh, let's say, domain, uh, vertical domains, smaller domains that we can cope better with. There is, um, there is an architect, um, a class architectures, and we get this layered architectures, uh, from this layered architecture from it, and we can define our architecture using the layer method. We'll define the layer front end defined by all the packages that are named front end that have front end somewhere on the package hierarchy, and we can use different or many package identifiers. API, the layer API, is defined by API, and layer backend is defined by anything backend in the package hierarchy. And then we can say, well, layer frontend may not be accessed by any layer. That makes sense. Um, and the user is no separate layer. And the layer APA may exist only by frontend and backend, and backend may not be accessed by any layer. So this is pretty common way of checking layered architecture. Let's run this. Okay, now we get, I get some violations. And it says, um, 
the constructor backend user repository calls the constructor of the front end user bean. That's not okay. The backend must not call the front end. I think the second um, violation is a field in the user repository. And then we've got API user service has a return type of backend. So the API must not contain types from the backend. That makes sense, three violations. So it's pretty easy to check your layered architecture, how many layers you ever may, may have. Uh, it's pretty easy to let ArcUnit check those layers. And if you do this in your microservice, it's even easier because you have less classes and less packages to check. Now to write those layered architecture and code is okay, but maybe you've got something like plant UML. Um, plant UML, you might know. Let's uh, see, it should start the editor. Oh, okay. Um, There it is, took some time. We have a plant UML definition, a component definition. And if you use plant UML, you can use plant UML to let ArcUnit check this uh, component diagram and its de uh, allowed dependencies. I can define the layers as seen before and uh, the package names are put into the stereotypes. So backend is everything with backend in the package and so on. And then I can define the allowed dependencies and let's say, um, yeah, let's uh, let's say maybe API is allowed to access backend. Oh, no, we've got a cycle and cycles are not a good idea, not at all. So let's remove this. Now I can use this plant UML file. Um, load that file. I use the simplest version, just lo loading a static file. You can, of course, load something from an URL or anything else. And I can say classes should adhere to the plant UML diagram with some options. Here I'll use only the dependencies in the diagram. You can consider all dependencies on your class path. Um, and there are some other options. I consider only the dependencies in the diagram. And let's run this check. And you'll see that we get the same three violations as before, because the layered architecture in the plant UML diagram is exactly the same that I wrote in the ArcUnit rule uh, before. So we've got a diagram that you can include in your, say, ASCII doc documentation or um, doc toolchain uh, documentation. We've got this diagram that we can um, can let can uh, ArcUnit um, that ArcUnit can check. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see if it really works. Let's uh, change this. I want to allow the backend accessing the front end. Backend is allowed to access the front end. Ooh. Ah. Okay, I still get a violation, but it's only one. So we just removed the two violations that the backend accesses the, uh, the front end. And this is not, not a good idea, not at all. So let's remove this again. But you see that you can use plant, uh, that you can integrate plant UML really, really easy into ArcUnit. Okay, what else uh, should you see? Yeah, some two more architectural styles. We can use slices. And slices are the things that you've seen here, those vertical slices, those smaller domains. Um, and we can slice our package structure at any given point. Uh, that means below demo. So we get our package hierarchy sliced into order, product, search, and user. And we uh, enforce the rule that it's that those four modules are free of cycles. And that's a good idea. You shouldn't have cycles in your modules, at least uh, high on that um, hierarchy. We could even say those slices should not depend on each other. And that's um, pretty difficult if you've got a monolith and the modules call, um, call each other directly via Java methods. But if you prepare your, um, your modules um, for them to be uh, ex um, uh, externalized as a, as a microservice, you can, as a first step, 
step check that they don't call each other. For example, because you already refactored them to use a Kafka topic to com for communication. So they don't have to call the Java classes. But this is a stricter check. Um, checking uh, for uh, absence of cycles is uh, the easier check and the one that should uh, be green in your application. Cycles aren't a good idea at all. And the last one is the onion style architecture. The onion style architecture, um, it's called onion architecture and we do, we do checks for onion architectures, um, ports and adapters and hexagonal architectures with this onion architecture. We define our domain model and services. We can split that up or we can put it in one, the domain models. This is the core of our uh, smaller service. Around this are the application services and around that the adapters. And ArcUnit checks that accesses only uh, occur from the outside to the inside, not the other way around. Um, and furthermore, all those adapters on the outside, they are specialized for one external system. And those adapters must not access each other. They must be isolated um, from each other. So it's pretty easy to define some internal models, some internal services and some external adapters. And ArcUnit just enforces those uh, this onion style architecture. Okay, anything else? Trump, Trump, Trump. Yeah, well, time's nearly running out. Um, you can do uh, custom conditions. Um, yeah, let's, let's have a quick check. Um, you can write something uh, like classes that have a funny name should reside in a funny package, just for you to get an idea. Um, and if I run this, We'll see the funny class, lots of fun, resides in a package front end, which is not funny. And if you look at the implementation, it's not that I won't go into the details, but um, it's not absolutely small, but it's manageable. And if we've got specialized um, conditions and specialized uh, predicates, that make our rules a lot more readable. And for example, in our projects, we use some uh, predicates and conditions um, for fields, for JPA entity fields, that they don't, um, that there's no eager loading, that uh, that always lazy loading is annotated and so on. So we can uh, define rules for fields and for the annotations and the values. And that's uh, um, absolutely manageable. Okay. So much more to say, that, but there is a really good user guide and the API documentation on the ArcUnit website. Let me just return to the slides once more and then we'll do some Q&A. Okay. So why should I use ArcUnit? Maybe you've got a deployment pipeline similar to this. You've got your build and unit test stage that goes to acceptance testing through other stages. And then finally, there's the deployment into test, into uh, pre-prod, into prod, what else? And really often you'll find um, the metrics check running separately after our build and unit test. Why so? Uh, these checks, um, like a JQ Assistant, Sonar Cube, um, they're really useful, but they usually take too long for the checks that we won't them won't run them within each single build that we do. So there's an architect, um, say someone who just has has a look each day or once a week at all the violations that uh, Sonar Cube or JQ Assistant uh, um, notify us of, and those architect goes back to the development team and says, oh, uh, you did some, you, you violated some of our rules and please fix those rules. Uh, you've got to do some refactoring. The classes don't fit in the packages. Please put them somewhere else. The problem is this feedback loop is pretty long. It takes a pretty long time. And when you've got a separate metrics stage and a separate person looking into that and reporting back to the development team. It might easily be that the development team is already in the next or on the next task after that one, and they don't have a clue anymore what they did yesterday because they just finished the task. Um, so it should be out of our mind and uh, getting 
uh, information, getting reports about uh, violations, architecture violations, will always get me out of context of my current task. This slows you down. And the brilliance, the ingenuity of ArcUnit is that it runs within our built-in ArcUnit uh, unit test stage because it's just a unit test that's been run by your unit test framework. The reports, um, uh, the violations are reported to the unit test uh, report and we can use it as developers. So the feedback loop is shorter by far and architecture uh, is becoming a team sport. And we still have an architect looking at those uh, metrics uh, applications because you get a better idea of which rules might be valuable in the future. And um, tools like JQ Assistant, uh, you can quer query your architecture much better to get an idea which rules you might need. But then we're going to co code those rules in ArcUnit uh, because we as a development team commit to those rules and not some architect saying you must uh, you must obey those rules. Uh, I don't like to obey rules. I like to understand them and commit to them uh, myself. And that what that's what ArcUnit can do for us, make architecture a team sport. There are alternatives and complements to ArcUnit, like I mentioned JQ Assistant, Sonar Cube, Sonar Graph, Structure 101. Uh, some of you are using those um, tools already, uh, or you're using Mbolt uh, that uses some ML or AI to reason about your uh, recent fixes and what you can do in the future. Um, and you can combine them. And I think that's the true power, not to say, oh, we're going to replace our existing tool by ArcUnit, but you can combine them and you can start small with ArcUnit. You can try it out, put it on your uh, test scope, just write some ru uh, rules and see if it helps you to bring architecture, the idea of architecture into your team. And if you see that it works, you can grow your architectural rules, your, your ArcUnit rules, um, and they can run um, together with other rules and then you can see which rules to, uh, to place where which which rules do we do we want in jq assistant or in sonar cube and which rules do we want in arcunit so you can grow it starting small and see if it works for you if you're using spring boot there's a modulus extension by oliver drotboom and that's based on arcunit so that's just an idea how Spring Boot applications should be structured. Um, have a look at this if you like to use it in your Spring Boot application. Um, you find everything on Oliver's webpage. Yeah, and everything else you'll find on Arcunet.org. Um, like a link to the official examples. Um, I'll post everything that I coded here to my Arcunet examples, um, and you. Of course, can have a look at the source code as well. ArcUnit is open source. You can contribute to it. There's even a .NET port. Um, yeah, and that's it for me. And I think we can do some Q&A and I'll go back to my camera so you, you can see me better. I'm not sure if I will see you, but you can see me better. Okay. Are there any, no, what questions do you have? Uh, Patrick, you, you, you're muted. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and also like for like how to get started into this. And um, I mean, while the questions are now coming in, I ask a question. And um, you showed that Oliver was also like um, creating like a starting point for modulifs. Um, is there other, are there other rules um, which are already there because usually I find it quite hard. I mean, you start small, obviously you need to grow, I guess also like maintaining the rules takes a lot of time, even though when you start splitting them up over a longer period, mm -hmm. but like when I say I want to have something like naming conventions or, or um, like we, we follow this kind of company standard, like the, let's say like the formatting of the Java code, like Google does or, or something like that. Is there something already I just can use? Um, yeah, but it's really basic rules. Um, it's some rules like um, uh, some naming conventions. And uh, I've mentioned the, um, the plugins um, for Maven and Gradle, and mm -hmm. they come with a certain set of basic rules that you can include in your build, uh, that you can activate or deactivate. Um, and those basic rules, yeah, you can use them. They're pretty uh, much common sense. 
Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I don't know of any other larger collection of rules. There are some artifacts on, on, Ma on Maven Central. One is for JPA, but actually, I don't know of any larger collection. Maybe time to start one. Um, because I found it, um, this should not be an excuse, but I found it really valuable to start small and to let this team decide which rules to use so they get used to ArcUnit, starting from the first, the smallest rule. And once you say, oh, here's all the rules, it's not a tool of the team anymore. Uh, so yes, maybe th there should be some of those uh, common rules, um, um, but I found it valuable for, for each team to start. And then if, as a company, if you see that your teams in your company have some rules in common, you can uh, put them to a JAR archive and include that via the Maven or Gradle uh, plugin. So what you also mean is actually the learning process of the team, why we are doing this rule and what do we need to change and, and all those things. But like, I want to maybe sometimes just like go one step ahead and, and start from second step and not just like yeah. really at the beginning. But yeah, yeah. sorry. Why not? I mean, I understand definitely that point. So Eric has now a question. He says, um, since you know JQ Assistance, can you do a quick comparison? What is different? Ah, knowing JQ Assistant is too much. Uh, I've been using it, uh, but I won't call myself a specialist in JQ Assistant. Um, I think JQ Assistant is really uh, brilliant if you import all your structures and can do some reasoning with a uh, cipher language and get quick answers um, what violations uh, you'll have. Um, and you can um, include this in your build pipeline as well. Mm -hmm. um, but maintaining those cipher queries can be tedious and not all of us speak cipher, the query language of JQ Assistant or of Neo4j. Um, so it's, it's a good tool to find uh, common violations in your architecture, but then it might be a good idea to, to transform this um, rule or the violations that you found to, to a tool that developers can use that can easier can use easier like ArcUnit, like Java code. Uh, so for finding violations and getting ideas for which rules to check, JQ Assistant might be better suited um, because with ArcUnit you might to do upfront what to do. You might you must have an idea of your structure in your mind, and uh, that what that's what uh, JQ Assistant takes care of. So finding rules might be easier with JQ Assistant, and mm -hmm. then you might transfer them. Um, rewrite them in ArcUnit rules and have them as uh, your development team architecture rules. I think that that's actually quite a good point you mentioned. Since actually in JQ Assistant, like everything is parsed, you have like the model of your code in, in the in the graph database, and then you can start explore, and then you can say, I want to have this rule, right? So uh, I see the point. That's actually quite quite great. Thank. Just to be clear, even ArcUnit keeps the whole model in memory or at least what you import. If I say classful importer, but writing those rules um, and comparing them and getting um, getting an idea of what's there might be quicker in JQ Assistant if you're used to JQ Assistant. For me, actually, it's easier to write the rules in ArcUnit. So that's my personal skill or non-skill. So Marius asks, we use Onion architecture in our project, but for every layer, there is a Maven module. How would you start testing that? For every layer, um, um, but for every layer, for every service. So if you've got an Onion architecture, you say you've got one service and in this service, you've got, um, you've got those layers. Um, is that your question? Maybe he can write for the, it for the core, uh, so not, not for the layer, sorry, for but for the uh, model and for the application ring and for the adapter ring, uh, you've got um, you've got those separate um, module, those separate jar archives. I think the easiest way would be um, either to import those jars. Um, I showed you the class file importer. We cannot just import packages, we can import jars. That we say, then you can say import those jars that I've already on my class path, and then you, um, those jars will be checked. This might be the easiest way in your um, uh, super module um, or in your application, actually. I think uh, there's one application module that uses the other modules. 
uh, if you don't just assemble them in, in some super POM. Um, and if you're working with um, some um, super module, um, you might use uh, the Maven plugin and um, just use, uh, just um, do your checks there. But I think it's easier um, to have an ArcUnit test in Java where you import those jars and then write your rules about the classes as we've seen. He just clarified in the chat that he's saying that actually they're doing domain and pour in a separate Maven module. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Nice. Um, then the next one, he's asking as well, what's the quickest and not painful way to implement rules with an external team of developers? Um, for example, these devs keep rotating and don't belong to your organization. Yep. Ooh, um, well, um, you must start somewhere, somewhere, someone must start defining those rules. And of course you can say as an internal architect, write some arc unit rules um, and then hand them over to the external team to maintain those rules. Um, this, um, this sounds a little bit like we make all the rules and the external team has to obey all the rules and there might be better choices um, because Arcunit is a tool, it's Java code, we can change it. And the actual idea is uh, we should change it if we think that some kind of architecture is better suited than our rules that we defined last year. So we can evolve the architecture over time. If you don't want that, there might be better, better tools like um, like Sonar, Sonar Graph or Structure 101, um, where you can define the dependencies externally, then you get a configuration file and check that configuration file. Um, yeah, but if you've got an external team and you allow that team to evolve those architectural rules and you do a review of those rules, if they evolve it the way you like, this might be even what you're looking for because if they're rotating, um, they've got a set of rules um, that they're responsible for. So every new developer will sooner or later see those rules because uh, he or she will violate one of them and uh, they must cope, they must handle ArcUnit. So it might be um, a great possibility um, to have them think about architecture, not as a given rules that we have to obey, but about something that we as a development team are, are responsible for doesn't fit the usual, here are the rules, please obey approach. <laughs> so um, now it just keeps me thinking because you, you mentioned like these rules and we saw even that we can use plant UML actually as, as rules. So um, that's quite nice. Is there also a way the other way around that we could visualize the rules? Mm, no, I'd like to say not yet. Um, I've seen something on um, the development branches in ArcUnit that might lead to a visualization. I'm not sure if that's what we're looking for. That is, we have our rules and please visualize our layered architecture, or our onion style architecture. That would be great. Mm -hmm. And I think there might be some work going on, but I don't know actually. Um, so no, at least not yet. I'm sorry. No problem. So there is like an opportunity to contribute. Yes. <laughs> so does the last version of Sonar Cube still check the cyclic dependencies in a project like the Arc unit does? And if not, do you maybe know why it has been removed? I don't know, actually. Um, I, th I think it does the cyclic dependency checks, but I don't know if the la latest version still does it. Uh, so maybe it's still there, maybe not, maybe it's just hidden somewhere else. Um, so both can check for cyclic dependencies, but I found Sonar Cube um, not as customizable if I want to do uh, more dependency checks than just uh, cyclic checks, uh, check for cycles. So I don't know, uh, maybe someone else from the audience. Yeah, if, if you do so, please write into the chat. And um, there is another one. So Marco is asking where to put your higher level rules, example, dependency checks in a modular application. Yeah, um, I'd separate this. If you've got some 
let's call it um, basic rules. Um, yeah, th this sounds like uh, we've got lots of modules and now how to check for our high level architecture if we've got thousands of, of modules. Um, so you need some place where all those uh, modules are imported or used and there you can write your, if you're using uh, ArcUnit for that, that you could write your um, J, uh, your ArcUnit test using class file importer import jars uh, that you import all the modules. Um, but if it's only about dependencies, if you have split your application into modules, I think there is an easier solution with a Maven plugin. Um, I, it just doesn't come to my mind how it's called. Like, ex there is a Maven, there is a Maven module um, that you can use to disallow certain dependencies. That you can say that module must not use that module. Um, and if you split your application into those modules, it might be a, those those Maven plugin might be the better choice, because uh, Arcunet shines if you've got something like a small monolith or a monolith uh, where can, you can ensure in one code base that certain rules are um, are not violated. Um, if you already did your modu modularization uh, using Maven modules or what else. Um, and you want just want to say, uh, okay, the entity jar doesn't must not access anything from the front end. There is an, uh, yeah. If if I uh, if I'll find the name, uh, I'll let you know afterwards. Um, Is it maybe the enforcer plugin? The enforcer, not X, but N. Enforcer. Thanks. Okay. Um, that's it. Yeah, Maven enforcer. Thanks, Eric. Um, so that might be the better choice if you've already modularized your application. Um, yeah. There was another question actually in the Q&A, but then Marcus wrote an answer and it, got, it disappeared. Okay. Um, it was about where are the violation priorities defined? <laughs> okay. Um, should I just switch back to the code? Then we can have a sure. quick look. Okay. Let me go to the screen. And I'll share once again IntelliJ. And let's have a look at our first, where is it? Um, our first test. Okay. Um, actually, the uh, priority is uh, nothing that uh, we just see the priority in, in the output of in the test report. We cannot check for it or uh, um, or suppress certain violations, but we can um, the priority just in front of uh, this. Now I can say priority high. In this way, this would be um, a high violation. I can use low and medium. Um, so that's just for us, uh, for information. Uh, so we see it in the test report, but uh, as far as I know, um, Arcunet doesn't do anything further with it. Okay. So that means it's just like for reporting purposes and, and nothing else. Exactly. So there is still like the test is failing, even though if it's a low priority, it's still the same and they will be all reported. Exactly. Okay. So really you, nice. just, you get a better idea because the developer of those uh, architectural rules said that's an, a high priority. If you get one of these, please fix it urgently. Um, just for us developers to um, categorize those messages. Great. Awesome. So um, we are actually through all the questions in the Q&A block. So if none are popping in in, in the next few seconds, um i think it's time to close for today anyhow it's already almost 20 past um seven and that means like we just made it in time that's really awesome um thank you very much for the presentation i also really enjoyed it and also the live coding which was wonderful and also with all these um different examples and so on i definitely need to dive into um the the code and um also, I mean, I will get in touch with you again. We can also send out the slides and the repository to the participants or just like add it to the, as we usually do to the um, 
to the entry of the event from today. So um, then it's referenced, but you anyway can send it out via Twitter if you like to. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much again. And then I just like switch to my last slide before everyone drops out. I <laughs> um, just want to say thank you like for the presentation, Thomas. Thank you for you participants joining the live stream and as well also our sponsors, which make this possible because, you know, like these great companies are supporting us. And usually in regular times, we would have like afterwards an upro. So now you have to get to the fridge yourself, get your beer and like enjoy the evening. And also um, thank you to the stuff behind the scenes like Marcus or Ursula, which is always way sending out all the emails and working in, in the back office for us. Make sure, please fill out the feedback form and then actually you have the possibility to win an idea, um, IntelliJ Ultimate license uh, like once a month and you will also get notified and we will mention that on Twitter as well. So have a nice evening and we are going to close the session now and you're just automatically forwarded to the feedback form. Thank you very much again, Thomas. See you Thank soon. You. Bye bye. Bye bye.